It's possible that if we all mute, unless we're speaking, that static may go away. Okay. Mm -hmm. okay. Can I share my screen? Um, sure. I just wanted to mention that um, we're going to start with Deb Richards today. Um, she's using someone else's computer, so you're not recognizing her name. Um, but Teams can be a challenge, so... Um, She's going to start in explaining about the um, housing at Creative Living Community of Connecticut. That was one of our interests for tonight. Yay. Thank you, Deb. Yay. Yay. Yes. Yep, you can share your screen. Can you see it? No, not yet. I know it's giving you trouble. Hello. <laughs> I'm clicking on share and then I'm clicking on the PowerPoint. Do you see it now? Thank no. you. No. What's in between? I don't know. So, Deb, you're you're clicking on share, but it's not coming up, right? Right. Exactly. Yeah. I am not a computer whiz. Is it possible to send it through to you, Mom, um, and then just have you share it on um, another on another? Um, I don't know. I could try. Another, like your like your team, your screen. I could give it a try, I guess. Ether, any idea? Um, Do you know? Is there, is there a way that you need to make Deb go out in order for her to share her screen? <laughs> That's the thing, she's, she's trying, but it's not working. Yeah. Yeah, it's not, it's not kicking in. Deb, do you want to try and send it to me and I'll see if I can get it up? Up, up, Woo! Oh, there we go. I got you and it. <laughs> Yay. You can see it now, I hope. We see you and we see it. Oh. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right, so welcome to Creative Living, Community of Connecticut. Um, my name is Deb Richards, and we have a contact information at the end of the presentation, so you'll know how to get um, in touch with us. Um, I've been involved with the organization, um, actually primarily over the last um, seven years. Prior to that, I was involved by attending some of their events, but then I became a board member and I chair their policy committee and I'm on their communications committee and do a variety of things. Um, we're primarily a volunteer organization with the exception of two uh, part-time employees. One of them is Kim Little, who runs our farm stand. She's our farm stand manager. Mm -hmm. So a little bit about um, Creative Living, our mission um, has always been to create a shared inclusive living experience for individuals with and without autism or intellectual or developmental disabilities. Um, it really was started by a group of parents who basically said, where are our adult children going to live when we're no longer able to care for them? And so um, the goal has always been to provide housing for approximately 50 individuals, 25% um, of those individuals having a disability, um, in an affordable housing arrangement, um, and that those who needed round-the-clock residential care would be able to get that. Um, 
We have been in existence for about a dozen years and have developed um, a variety of programs that will eventually transition to the property. Um, so I'm going to talk to you a little bit about that. And our current status is um, we are located, our um, farm stand and the property is located in Coventry. We've been well accepted by the town. Um, we've gone through zoning approval um, one time and we're in the process of amending our approval just because we've made some changes to our plan. And the idea is to have what's called a pocket neighborhood. And I'll show you a little bit about that. Um, and to have a bunch of social enterprises um, coming out of the property. So a little bit of history. Like I said, we started in 2007, originally as a mission project out of the Lutheran Church in Manchester. Um, and they awarded us a grant that allowed us to create a greenhouse operation in Vernon, Connecticut, um, where we do vocational training and we continue to have our microgreen business there that we grow and sell microgreens to restaurants in the greater Hartford area. Um, once we got that established, we then started working on um, planning for the housing part of our project. Um, and as part of that, we spent some time looking for some property where if you follow down through some of the history in July of 2018, we actually had raised enough money to outright purchase 10 acres of land in Coventry, Connecticut, right on um, Route 44. So it's got pretty reasonable access. Um, and we also then hired our first full-time executive director. We then moved forward. We have um, a variety of barns and there's one house on the property that we're currently renovating. And we also built a farm stand up closer to Route 44, so we're easy on off. From those who uh, know Eastern Connecticut, we're kind of the thoroughfare for people who are traveling to and from Yukon. That's one of the primary employees in Eastern Connecticut. So we do get a lot of foot traffic. And then once we had the farm stand in place, um, we started hiring our first paid um, individuals with disabilities to work in the farm stand. We pay them minimum wage. Um, we continue to do that from May to October when we operate the farm stand. And in January 2022, we worked with um, a national expert named Mark Olson, who's created similar communities to the one we're trying to build in about 10 other states. And we worked with him for about 15 months to develop a strategic plan and a business plan all around the housing um, aspect of our property. And we're currently working with Union Studios and Eric Bush from the Peregrine Group, um, refining our plans to move forward um, with pursuing funding for the housing. And please stop me at any point um, if you have questions and, or we can open it up for questions at the end. So as I said, this um, is um, our greenhouse, our 12th year of microgreens. And you see the list of restaurants. Please support those restaurants because they support us. Um, and they have wonderful microgreens in their salads. Um, so we have individuals who work in the greenhouse. Our um, microgreens are also delivered by a paid employee who's an individual with disabilities and his support staff um, transports him to and from the different restaurants in the greenhouse. This is our beautiful farm stand. Um, so we have um, a variety of fresh produce um, during the summer seasons. We also have a com community supported agriculture program. So we have people who order their vegetables um, a season in advance and pick them up once a weekend. Um, some of the products we have there are actually grown um, on the farm. Um, we do have chickens on the farm. So we have fresh eggs and flowers and then we pick up from a variety of local farms so that we have a variety of good produce for people who want to um, purchase their products from us. And as I said, we always have unpaid vocational employees at the farm stand and they are um, coupled with a volunteer who works in association with them. Um, we've been fortunate I'm that- Oh, go ahead. I'm one of those people. Oh yeah, Ellen. Ellen is one of those people. You'll see her smiling face if you come to the farm stand. She's a great, yep. great ambassador for our program. So thank uh -huh. you for chiming in with that, um, Ellen. Um, I'm and sorry. We have had, 
individuals who have worked at the farm stand who then have moved forward to, they got enough confidence with their experience in the farm stand to move forward in other um, businesses with paid employment. So certainly that's our goal. And not that we, we love having them working in the farm stand, but really it's meant to be um, a stepping stone for vocational so some of our other programs, I talked a little bit about the vocational, but we also are um, a major hub of social activities for the individuals who participate in our programs. We have a once in the week arts in the afternoon program on Tuesday afternoons. Um, they do a variety of projects and occasionally also um, take some excursions to go mini golfing, to go to a movie in the evening, to go bowling in the evening. Um, and we provide a variety of workshops, um, including yoga on the, um, at the farm stand um, over the summer. So we do try to keep our folks really um, socially engaged um, in developing relationships. And some of those individuals um, may end up living on the property, but some just take advantage of um, the camaraderie that we develop among the program participants and enjoy the social activities. So just to give you an example of how we're structured, um, I will say as um, I was um, a speech pathologist, I'm a retired special ed director, and I was incredibly impressed when I joined the board and saw the sophistication of their bylaw and the way their board of directors operates and their governance committee, um, very tight fiscal guardrails. And so the board of directors really is the entity that runs the organization. And then you see in the blue boxes, we have a variety of committees um, that are primarily volunteers. And so we have a chair of each of those committees. Um, and those are really the, um, the entities that run the organization. And then you see under the profit centers, those are really our micro businesses. So obviously the housing is what we're working on developing right now. We've got pretty sophisticated in the food and farming um, department. Um, the one thing I didn't mention is we are do have an association with Round Hill Alpacas, and there is a plan for the alpacas eventually to move to the farm as part of the farming community. Um, talked about the vocational training program, and we have a lot of collaborators and partners. Um, we've worked very closely with Journey Found because they were already a provider for some of the individuals that we work with but also um, in the past Corporation for Independent Living, Union Studios, um, and Hartford Foundation. So just to give you a sense, um, you know, we really rely not only on volunteers, uh, we do some grant writing that um, helps support primarily our vocational training and paying our vocational trainees, um, but we do a variety of fundraisers throughout the year. <laughs> Um, we usually have a large fundraising event in the winter. Um, historically, that's been held at the pond house. Um, we have um, our farm stand. We do a variety of special events at the farm stand throughout the summer. For example, this summer, I know we're doing the yoga. We're doing basket making. We're going to do some herb workshops. Um, and then we have a, quite a large uh, farm to table dinner at the property. Um, this year, that will take place in July, and actually it's going to be a barbecue with Bears Barbecue. So we're changing it up a little bit to add a little variety to the event. And then we do an um, annual golf tournament in September, and then we have an annual appeal in November. But between the small grants and these fundraisers, that's primarily um, what sustains our operating budget. This gives you a sense of what our community design looks like. So if you look at the very top, that's Route 44 at the very top of the um, picture. And then that first little red building is actually our farm stand. The building behind it, the larger red building, is meant to be a program building um, because we anticipate having an opportunity to build that as part of the community. And then you'll note there's like a tree line. So the property actually was very nicely situated and that we have a lot of exposure to the community in the front of the property. Then there's the tree line. And then behind that are really the barns and where the cottages or the pocket community will be. And that's all those little yellow roofs that you see there. 
Um, so um, it really provides kind of a, a natural barrier for a little bit of seclusion in the back of the property for the individuals who live there and having more of the community activity um, in the very or the community beyond the community that lives there. Um, so we're really fleshing this out with Union Studios right now um, and looking at recruiting a development director who will assist us with the capital campaign to move forward with um, the funding that we need to get the infrastructure established. I mentioned Mark Olson. This is a little bit of about Mark, and we can certainly make this PowerPoint available to you if anybody wants to do a little research on Mark. He's got a pretty um, impressive resume. He was the parent of um, a daughter with significant disabilities and got into this business for the same reason our parents got into this business, because they realized there were very few options um, for his daughters and decided to make that his passion in moving forward to establish their community, but also to assist other entities in establishing a similar community. So that's kind of the, the overview. Um, you know, you see my information, our current board chair, our wonderful farm stand manager, um, Cindy, and, and Ellen, who's also. Cindy, are you on the call? I can't see. Maybe not. I thought she was going to join us. I do have another board member here with me, actually. Carol Perkin is off to the side, um, just listening in on the presentation. Hello, everyone. <laughs> um, so I'll stop there and see if I can figure out how to stop sharing um, now that I learned how to share. And so does anybody have any questions for me? It's a lot of information, but we just wanted to give you an overview of where we were in our um, development. Hi there, my name's Shannon. I don't know how to raise my hand. Oh, wait a minute, there's how to raise my hand in Teams. <laughs> We're all learning new skills tonight, Shannon. Um, if you mention this, my apologies. Um, when do you envision that residential component will be available? Well, I think that our question right now is pursuing our funding. We hope um, in the next, like if you look at our strategic plan, it's over the next three or four years. Um, we do have a house on the property that we're currently renovating, so that will probably be the first um, place that we'll make available. And right now, part of what we're doing with Union Studios is trying to make a decision about what infrastructure we need to build first, and do we build all at once? Do we build, you know, three or four cottages first and then move forward with three or four more cottages? And a lot of that really just depends on our ability to um, certainly, our parents are very anxious for us to get moved. Mm -hmm. I thought I thought we were using the house. That was my initial initial um thing. I thought we were using the house, and then you're you're right, Ellen. Our plan is definitely that the house the house is well underway. We've done some significant renovation to it already, um, and actually just got a pretty large grant to put solar power on the house. And our plan initially is to make the bottom floor, the house will be completely accessible, but to make the bottom floor available, of course, to run some of our programs while we're building the rest of the community and we build the, the larger community building. And we see that larger I mean, community building for not only our community on the property, but opening it up to the broader, you know, greater Coventry. That's what I, community that's what I thought, like, that's what mom was saying, um, and that's, what like you guys were talking about like I thought you guys were taking the house and like using it for other things and then the cottage and everything I was like um what <laughs> yep. nope you're right on Ellen you, you always keep me honest thank you <laughs> <laughs> I try I try yes uh, Lori you have questions hi Paula thank you so much that is that was amazing that was really amazing you're doing wonderful wonderful things i um have just a couple of questions on the residential piece now you're that would be open to individuals um without disabilities correct absolutely 75 so, percent of the residents would not be individuals with disabilities 
Okay, okay. And what type of um, structure are you are you planning? Small houses, or are you planning an apartment complex? Or no, it's it's a variety. It's called it's what's referred to as a cottage community. So they're they're relatively small, single family homes, if you will, one, two, or three bedrooms. Um, oh, wow. but designed to be in fairly pro close proximity to each other so that there is a lot of community interaction, but the individuals would actually be in their, in, in a home that would be um, entirely there. Okay, and the, and the, the DDS consumers, uh, that would be a group of individuals um, that would be interested also in the farming, the day program piece as well as the absolutely. residential or or not oh absolutely so i think there's a possibility one as we grow our micro businesses for either um people who are just interested in guarding from a leisure perspective but also potentially paid employment but we don't see it as a requirement like you have to work at the farm in order to live there but certainly it would provide a lot of opportunities for social interaction and potentially paid employment for some people if that's what they choose Okay, yeah, it, it, it sounds amazing. Thank you so much for sharing. And I think part of what we are trying to do, I mean, we all recognize the dilemma of residential options. And in Eastern Connecticut, we, you know, I heard that from families for years as a speech pathologist and a special ed director. Um, so our goal was really to try to build something that was manageable, but maybe could serve as a model pilot for the state of how to move forward mm -hmm. in an inclusive way, but still, you know, as much as possible in a cost effective way to provide services and supports for people at whatever level. You know, we have some individuals who may need 24 7 care, but we have some individuals who won't need that, but they need the access to some supervision and a community that's checking in with them on a regular basis. I see. Okay, thank you. Any other questions? It looks like Donna. Yes. Hi, everybody. Okay. Um, so this is just so fascinating to me. And um, I actually went to some meetings back like years and years ago, and I, I remember seeing a whole different plan. So this is a very, very interesting um, plan, and I'm so impressed that everybody put a lot of work into this. So. Um, my question, and I'm not sure I can like get it in my brain the right way, so you might have to help me get it out. What I'm trying to figure out is for those people who do need 24-hour um, supervision, where does that come from? Do, are, is like the family responsible for finding people? Is DDS involved? Is Does it have to do with part of the budget? Like how does that part work? That was my first question. Yeah, that's a that's a great question. So the, the first thing is you you are correct. We had a much more ambitious plan when we started, and then as things happen over time, you customize it and you realize what does our community really want. So we did start with a relatively large apartment building, and then once we were introduced to this concept of the cottage community, particularly for parents in Eastern Connecticut, it's like that feels much better. That that looks more like us. Um, <laughs> so anyway, um, what we see happening is the, the nonprofit CLCC would be the owners of the building and the managers of the property, individuals who were there um, who required 24-7 care and potentially were clients of DDS, we would have a service provider. CCLC would not be the service provider for those that 24-7 care. We'd have um, individuals potentially on the property and providing some programming to anyone who lived there, but we wouldn't be the primary service provider for individuals who needed that and they would use their, their state funds in order to access that. The provider of their choice, who happened to work with Journey found they're very familiar with us, but we wouldn't limit people to a particular provider if that's not you know, who they chose to use. And so where do those funds come from for the provider? Well, I think that's part of, you know, we've, we've had um, some initial conversations with DDS that if we had individuals who qualified for DDS and were on the property, um, you know, how they would go around accessing those residential service supports. 
that they would need in order to live there. So that's part of what we're trying to tease out right now. And then we have other individuals who may not need that significant. We certainly have individuals who don't qualify for DDS services, some of whom are on the, well, I'd say qualify, some who are on the autism waiting list, uh, but other individuals who haven't even accessed those services. So we're in the process right now of determining um, what our selection process is going to be for who's going to live on the property and how do we assure that they have the funding they need to live there safely. Okay, so that's to be determined. Yep, yep. But we are having active discussions about that right now. Got it. Okay, so that's what most of my questions are built around. So I'll just wait patiently <laughs> for the information. <laughs> and I just want to tell you my um, my daughter did go to the art thing. Was that just yesterday? Yeah, Tuesday afternoon. Was yeah. Afternoon. yeah. Um, so, you know, we just, it, it, we really appreciate it. And she's gone bowling with the group as well in the past. So um, we just appreciate that you're so open to like people joining in and Yes, yeah. it was really very, very appreciated. Thank, right. you. Thank, you. Thank you. It looks like Shannon. Hi there, one more quick question. I know that you're in the feasibility stage and working with a consultant. Do you have a ballpark for what your first round of fundraising that you're looking for? Dollar amount? I don't know. I mean, Mark had given us, you know, a sense of what he thought the entire thing would be and his ballpark was five to seven million dollars. Okay. Yeah. Part of it is the infrastructure on the property um, that needs to be done. Clearly, there's there's water and power there um, now, but not to the extent that's needed for the multiple homes that would be there. And also in Coventry, we're inches away from a city sewer line that they're debating whether it's going to go past our property. We're like, yes, come on. Just bring it down the entire 44. Just go right by our property. <laughs> Got it. Thank you. Sure. All right. Any other questions? Well, you certainly have access to Kim and Ellen anytime. They can probably answer questions um, better than I can. Absolutely. Um, but I do appreciate the opportunity to share this. Um, you know, it's a. Uh, it's, it's a gift to be able to be involved in it. Oh, I'm sorry, Sue, you had a question. I did. I'm so sorry. Um, I was being patient and I didn't realize that um, I had asked some questions in the um, chat. Um, oh. Are you looking into aquaponics as part of this for a year round indoor farming? Actually, that's that's a great question. We do have someone who's pursuing that with us. Um, primarily, we are thinking of it um, in the greenhouse. Um, like as a way to right. expand our greenhouse operations. So we do have someone who's doing some investigation. We do have a part-time greenhouse manager who's doing a great job, but he's working with one of our volunteers on pursuing that as an option. Okay, because I'm a teacher oh. and I do aquaponics. Oh, great. Oh. So All right. I am volunteering. Okay. I don't okay. know how to give you any well, information. Well, be in touch. You, you might hear from, um, from us in the near future. Thank you, that's great. We nice. okay. everybody's expertise. Okay, and I don't know how to get your information because I'm willing to call you, uh, no. but I'm not nope. sure how to get a hold of you. Um, so um, I'll make sure Kim gets the PowerPoint presentation to send to yep. everybody on the call and my yep. email information and there's a bunch of contact information on the last slide. Okay. And Kim, because you're welcome to micro, my You said microgreens <laughs> and I know how to grow microgreens. All right. Wonderful. So, Good. yeah, I'm there. Oh, thank you. So thank Herbs, you. spices, 100%. Oh, wonderful. Right. Shannon, right. do you have another question or is that your hand from previous? Oh, that, that was, was my hand from previous. Um, I got to figure um, out how to lower it now. Oh, there we go. Thank you. Hi. Sorry. Deb, I, have a, I have a question. Deb, I have a question. Go ahead, Alan. Um, I was kind of yeah, Mom answered, asked this question, but I'll just ask it. Um, are are we concerned that, um, like the age shift, like, are, do we like pick on like the ages, or is it, does it matter? I don't think I don't think it matters because we envision <coughs> people who move on the property might be people with a family with young children. I mean, you know, we're assuming the individuals with disabilities who will want to move on there 
are over the age of 18 or 22 that they aged out of their school-based services and are looking as anybody of that age might be to establish themselves more independently. But I don't think we we have a need to um, limit the age of individuals who are on the property. Okay. Good question. I was I was just I was just asking because I know Rachel. Sure. I'm looking out for Rachel. <laughs> Rachel. Yeah. Thank right. you, Ellen. Thank you. <laughs> You're very sweet no to do that. It's very kind yeah. of you, honey. So All anyway, right. anybody is welcome to reach out to me with questions. I do have to excuse myself because I'm teaching yeah. a class at five thirty. <laughs> Thank you so much. Oh, no. We really appreciate this. My pleasure. Anytime. And again, reach out to me with any questions that you might have. All and right. I'll make Thank sure you all get a copy of the PowerPoint. Wonderful. Thanks, Ellen. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. All right. I, I think our next item would be the regional director's update. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Can you hear me? I'm on my phone. I'm sorry. I don't have my laptop. Can you okay. hear me? You're yes, good. we can hear you. Okay, great. So much. Um, <laughs> hey, I'm on my phone too, so, you know. <laughs> so I wanted to share um, the uh, the deputy commissioner's Tuesday forum. Uh, next one is on individualized employment and day opportunities. So please uh, tune in, and if you can't uh, remember, there's a recording that we uh, place on the website in order for you to uh, see it afterwards. Um, I hope uh, everyone was able to uh, see the last one that was on the um, on residential, because as I told you before, that was really an inspiring uh, story of an individual um, that had moved from a congregate setting into his own apartment and how successful it was. So I hope you're able to uh, go see that one. Um, I also want to share, I remember in our last conversation, uh, we had a lot of conversation in regards to GTI and the uh, transition and the challenging, you know, um, aspects of it. And I wanted to share with you that um, all every region's RAC had a discussion around GTI. So we thought it would be great for each of the uh, regional RACs and the uh, Central Office Council for all of us to um, get together for a special meeting on May 23rd at 5.30, and that would be um, a virtual meeting with GTI so we can get any questions that you um, have still outstanding answered. Um, you know, I shared the feedback in regards to the last couple of forums, how it was hard to hear and, you know, not hearing other people's questions and the answers. So, uh, you know, the commissioners heard the feedback and they have been meeting daily with GTI. Um, so I hope that, you know, you are able to, to make that meeting. Um, we will send it out in an email and um, we'll record that session if you're unable to make it. But we just, I just want to let you know that we heard your concerns in regards to the challenges with the, the transition. Okay, um, and let's see what else did I want to tell you. Oh, um, the House bill, the 5001 bill for planning and developing of the Transition Academy. Um, we have um, managers that are now, you know, trying to uh, build that proposal for the legislators. Um, and they've been doing sites in each region to see which site would be most appropriate to develop this academy. Uh, in our region, in the North region, they're looking at uh, Woodbridge, which is in East Hartford. Um, so we'll we'll see what, what happens. We're gonna do a walkthrough in a couple of weeks to just you know survey the area and see if that's a great location to have that transition academy. And the transition academy is gonna be developed in order for individuals in their early 20s and even later 20s to learn skills, cooking, money management, uh, transportation, um, to, you know, be able to live more independently. So, um, you know, look out for that for more information, but it's just right now a proposal that we're uh, presenting, DDS is pre presenting to legislation for approval. Um, any questions so far? Uh, yeah. Um, 
Stacy, when is the individualized employment presentation? Uh, is that a fourth Tuesday? Uh, yes. Okay. Um, okay. Let me see. I don't. Or let, Thursday, Thursday or the, Tuesday. Wait, what's the date? Let me see the date of the. I had it pulled up. I'm sorry. Let's see. I'll give you the specific date. Twenty third. Twenty third. Twenty third. Great. Twenty third. Of April. And yes. And if you go on our website, you'll see um, you'll see something that's called Tuesday Forum. If you click on that, that's where you'll find our uh, schedule, and that's where you'll find all the recordings of the past uh, forums that have taken place already. Yes. Thank you very much. Thank you. You're welcome. Any other questions? Okay, um, I wanted to um, introduce uh, next Sheila, Sheila Swedler. Um, you remember uh, two meetings ago, we had uh, introduced executive management team and Sheila was unable to attend that evening, but she's come to tonight to introduce herself. Um, there's Sheila. Sheila, you can uh, introduce yourself and tell them a little bit about what you do. Sure. Okay. I I got booted out twice, so <laughs> it, hopefully it doesn't do it again. I don't know. I was hearing a lot of static, but that that has gone away. Um, but thank you for having me. Um, and I do recognize um, some people on this committee. So um, it's nice to see some people that I haven't spoken to in a long time. Um, but just to give you a little bit of my background, um, I was a DDS case manager for seven years, and um, I, then I became a case management supervisor, um, and I also have um, experience in the private sector. So now as the quality director, I'm just, um, you know, looking through a different lens, but still advocating for individuals, um, and I'm responsible for quality um, assurance inspections and other um, structured audits. Um, and in the end, this will help with development and implementation of um, regional quality improvement plans um, for different divisions within DDS. Um, my position um, has been evolving um, as time goes on, um, but by having this oversight, um, it's going to help ensure that services are uh, provided um, in accordance with the DDS mission and waiver requirements. Um, and we're always, you know, trying to improve the upon the overall health and safety and quality of services um, so that our individuals can have the best quality of life. Does anyone have any questions? Thank you, Sheila. Okay. I also wanted to mention that the the Connecticut Family Service Network is having a conference on May 2nd, uh, One Voice in North Haven. Um, I, let me see if any is anyone on from the Connecticut, the Connecticut Family Service Network. I can't I'm on my phone. I can't I can't see. No, <laughs> I, I, I am. No. <laughs> it's Adriana. Said, oh. Oh, <laughs> oh, yay. yay. I'm, sorry. <laughs> I'm like, oh, I miss a meeting and nobody recognizes me. <laughs> oh, no. no I apologize. I'm on my phone, so I can't see everyone, but um, we can't yeah, see okay. you. <laughs> I know it says A. Ramirez guest, but that's how I was set up when they set me up, at, you know, in state. So it was kind of funny, but I won't take much time. Thank you. Yes, we are um, very happily running our annual One Voice conference for parents and caregivers. We're so excited. It's going to be in North Haven. Um, we're going to have some great resource tables, some great presenters. There will be a light breakfast and lunch. It runs from 9 to 2. And I will happily share the flyer. I will put the registration link in the chat right now, but afterwards I will share the flyer um, and my contact information, but we're really thrilled. It'll be presented just as last year in English and Spanish, and we're gonna have some great combinations of education, relaxation, talking about um, compassion fatigue, a little bit of everything. So hoping to give um, parents an opportunity to network and make connections and and just enjoy the day. So thank you. 
Awesome. Thank you. Um, also, I have um, Heather Cohen, our prep coordinator on uh, today. Heather. Hi, everyone. Um, thank you for letting me um, attend your meeting and present um, the planning and resource allocation manager in the North region. I've been in the position a little under two years. Um, I spent most of my career in the West region. I'm wearing a variety of hats, including a case manager for about 14 years and a case management supervisor for about 10. Uh, um, I'm enjoying my new um, position as the Pratt manager. And um, with that said, I believe you all know what Pratt is, but it's our planning and resource allocation team. And th that's the committee you come to if you need either day or res funding. So we've we have some initiatives this year that I'd like to review with you. Um, and I'm happy to answer any questions. The first initiative we have for this fiscal year is our CCH or Community Companion Home Initiative. This these are um, licensed family homes um, for folks who are interested in residential supports, um, but maybe not as restrictive, say, as a CLA or a CRS. So um, it's it's a family home, and and it's it's basically um, run as such. And our CCH department does a really good job of trying to mix, match up providers with individuals to make sure folks' needs are met. And it's a nice match. We also have our supportive housing initiative, which um, Elba will be um, reviewing right shortly. So um, I'll let her fill in all the details for that, but it's a really nice initiative, supportive housing that we're excited about. We also have our assistive technology initiative. Um, this is to increase folks' independence in, in their home or family home. Um, you could, if you feel that um, your loved one or you, you or your loved one would like to increase their independence or, or safety, um, they could talk to your case manager and you can come to Pratt for an assistive funding for an assistive technology assessment and they're very individualized. Um, we also have an initiative currently for day po day program and employment. Um, if folks need additional day supports, if they or employment supports, they want to explore, secure, or maintain employment, um, talk to your case manager and come on to Pratt, and hopefully we'll be able to assist. We also have a um, we also had an IHS um, initiative this year. That we ran from information in our PAT database for folks who wanted increase um, in home supports and they were an urgent on our wait list. So it was great to be able to fund quite a few individuals and families. Um, and we also have a remote supports incentive, um, which is like IHS only, it's obviously a remote support. It's for folks that don't need um, hands on care or a person or in-person supports, but that benefit from a call and a FaceTime um, to assist as needed. So we're excited about that one too, because that's pretty brand new. Um, so if you're interested in, in any of these initiatives, um, reach out to, to your uh, DDS case manager, um, or if you need additional, if you feel your loved one or, or, or you would like additional supports or services, um, talk to your case manager and determine if a Pratt request would be beneficial. Does anyone have any questions? Cindy, do you have a question? Where is your hand? Oh, I'm sorry. No. My hand was up for, uh, for Stacy. I'm sorry. No worries. No Thank worries. You. I do that all the time. <laughs> Ellen, do you have a oh, shit. Ellen, do you have a question? You're on yeah. mute? Here. Um, I'm actually me and my mom. My mom's on the call as well. Um, me and my mom, um, I'm actually looking for a place. Um, but my only thing, well, me and mom talked about it for a while. Um, if it is it possible if somebody gets a house, can you bring in like technology and like like because like the mic mom help me out here? Yeah, I think I yeah. Once you get into a placement, then I think we can assess to see what your needs are. Absolutely. Right, that's, what that's what I mean. Yep. Yep. Absolutely, Ellen. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. 
Any other questions? Thank you, Heather. Oh, well, thank yes, you. It was nice you. to meet you all. <laughs> um, Cindy, you had a question for me? Oh, Stacy, thank you. No, you already answered it. It was uh, oh, okay. regarding the individualized point, uh, employment presentation. Yeah. Oh, thank you, Stacy. Thank you. Um, and our uh, next DDS presenter, um, Elba Carbella. Okay. Hello. I'm Elba. here. Yes, oh, I'm great. Right here. <laughs> okay, I'm sorry. Computer is okay. being slow. Okay. I hear you. Hi, everyone. Um, between uh, presenting on um, the second Tuesday uh, forum and um, at some community groups, I may have um, met some of you, and some of this information might be a little repetitive, but um, I just want to make sure that we're all on the same page and understand. Um, what it is that we're talking about and how we're moving forward on this um, in, on this initiative. Um, GDS defines supportive housing um, as housing that is not time limited, has a primary purpose of assisting GDS supported individuals to have ind independence and uh, live independently in the community and meet the obligations of tenancy. And what that means is that in the model of, of supportive housing, um, the tenant um, is actually the individual. It's not uh, DDS um, renting or subletting a space and then allowing, you know, making some arrangement for an individual to use it. The actual renter and that person responsible for the rent is the individual. And uh, we, of course, provide um, rental assistance, and um, I can talk about that a little bit later if you're interested. Um, first of all, let me say, I just looked up and saw myself, I broke my glasses today. So I'm not trying to be cool with the dark glasses, they're the only glasses that are available. So I apologize for that. <laughs> I just looked up and I was like, ooh, no, okay. So. <laughs> Supportive housing combines suitable, safe, and affordable housing with individualized support services. All residents of um, supportive housing must have access to flexible, individualized services for as long as they're needed to achieve and retain the permanent housing, the independent housing. Residents of supportive housing should also uh, will also be receiving supports to assist in increasing their life skills and achieving greater choice and independence. And from the reports that we have gotten from the staff that works with in the individuals who have moved into supportive housing, they're um, surprised at how quick, how, how um, excited individuals are about trying to cook for themselves or about, you know, wanting to organize their, um, their uh, cupboards the way they want them and, and sort of have those ideas and really are moving forward. And so it's um, really very, very exciting um, to see. So um, supportive housing settings are mixed income affordable housing complexes that partner with local DDS qualified service providers to identify units throughout the development for DDS supported individuals identified and supported by the partner provider agency. And so the lead uh, entity in terms of a supportive housing initiative or project is at least on, on our side, I would say, is the agency. And so the agency um, identifies and um, establishes a partnership with the developer, and then they come to us with, air quotes, the idea. Um, when we have, and we have, had developers come to us, we provide them with a list of the um, providers that are um, registered with us and are eligible to be involved in supportive housing uh, with DDS, and they go forward and find them. Um, we are not, we have to be very, as you know, the state have to be very careful not to be showing preferences for different agencies or anything like that. So we really, um, what's interesting is that um, providers have referred other providers, like they've, they've got a project going on and then someone else, you know, says, how'd you get that started and how could we get it started? And they sometimes refer uh, to a partner agency. 
Um, so it's, it's um, you know, you tell someone and I tell someone and then they tell someone and it goes on like that. And we're very excited about the extent to which the word of mouth is working in our favor. Um, there are some parameters for settings, okay? No more than 25% of the units in any development can be designated as um, subsidized housing for special populations. And the our population is one of those groups. There are some uh, individuals that are served by GSS, others um, uh, the Veterans Association, other by other by um, the um, oh, I'm blocking on the name, but basically the elder, the group that handles things specifically for elders, and they do supportive housing work as well. The way that we have proceeded is that um, we don't overlap in a in a development. So it's unlikely that we might have two or three units and then someone, um, you know, might have a few units of someone who came, comes from D, uh, DSS with hardcore, um, you know, long-term homelessness or anything like that. So when we partner with an agency, we partner to be their provider of um, in special populations, basically, of individuals who are have a need. The owner or management company um, has executed a contract with a GDS qualified provider that aligns the responsibilities of the owner and of the responsibilities of the provider, what they can expect from our, our agency and what the agency can expect from them. Um, there's a working partnership that includes ongoing communication between and among service providers, property owners, proper and property management um, entities, and individuals and their families as needed. Our goal would be that the provider would uh, carry that responsibility in terms of communicating um, on behalf of the individuals that we're serving in that particular location. Um, the individual's use of services or programs is not a condition of tenancy. So if someone, um, the, the, the agencies are the ones that identify um, the individuals. Um, they're referred by, by us, it comes through the Pratt process mm -hmm. and they're referred um, to the provider. The provider screens for um, compatibility with the model, whatever that happens to mean. and um, and so that the individual is placed in that um, living situation, but they're not committed to have to accept services or have to accept services from those individuals as a condition of their tenancy. So really they are, um, the goal is to give them a lot more free will and um, ability to make informed choices. And that, that's an area where we um, engage the families a lot in helping us because it it uh, it makes me think of way back when God was a boy and I went off to college. Um, nobody could tell me nothing, you know, and I just wanted to do what I wanted to do. And usually I wanted to do what I thought was fun. And then there was some responsibilities that weren't that much fun, like kind of laundry. And so I was like, eh, maybe I won't do that. And so we need to um, engage and partner and explain that some of these things we don't want to do so much are part of living independently. You know, cooking is great and is a lot of fun for some people. I'm not one of those people. But anyway, I understand that cooking is great and fun for a lot of people. And they um, really enjoy that. But after you cook and you enjoy your meal, if you had any company, if your parents came over, or your neighbor came over, then they leave and it's 930 and you're tired and you want to go to bed and there sit all of the dishes in the kitchen. And so that's part of the price you pay for cooking on your own. And you know what I'm saying? So there's there are ups and downs. And, and we, um, if we have struggled in any area, I would say that that's, that's one of the areas where we work very effectively with families and really have needed their help to partner with us saying, well, this, you know, this goes along with that. So doing groceries and cooking you like, dishes you don't like so much, they're a package deal. You know, they're not, um, they're not separate. And so, uh, and we had success, but as you can imagine, I'm not sure that that's something we had anticipated. Um, I don't ask me why we should have all of had, all of us have had those experiences in one way or another. So um, we actually have two 
uh, ways of implementing supportive housing. The first way of implementing supportive housing is where the process begins um, with the developer and the the partnership between the developer and the provider, and they come together, they work on what the design would be, where the units would be located, what is 25% um, of the units, does the provider want um, to handle as many as whatever 25% of the units are, if it's a huge development, um, and they work on everything together, right, from the beginning all the way to um, the um, all of the paperwork and the ribbon cutting and the whole thing. Um, the second, and of course that takes, that could take over two, three years. The short, quick ones are maybe 18 to 24 months. So it's not something that happens overnight. And um, with, we're still, there are certain aspects of our collective lives that still haven't completely bounced back from COVID. And we don't hear a lot about the supply chain, but the supply chain is still torturing developers. There are certain pieces that they just have to wait and wait and wait for, and they can't move forward on their um, complex um, until this particular piece comes in. And so you, we never know what it is that's going to slow us down. You know, it could be Mother Nature, it could be the supply chain, but, um, you know, we need to go with the flow. If there's a way to make it to have, make it happen more quickly, trust me, the developers will, because in their reality, time is money. And so um, we work very closely with them to get that off the ground and moving, and our goal is to have identified um, the individuals that are going to move in to the to the um, setting, have them ready, have them um, have um, done the uh, all of the paperwork and the applications and all of that kind of stuff so that it can be smooth sailing. We have learned from the earlier um, the earlier uh, projects and, and the North region is one of the well, you guys have uh, several projects. So I know Stacy knows that we wait and wait and wait. And then when they say go, they meant yesterday. And so then we're all scrambling to sort of get things done and, and get everything ready. But we're getting better at it. We're actually getting better at it. So that's the that's what we call project based supportive housing. We were not in our most creative mode when the up uh, opportunity came to us and the possibility came to us for an alternative and we in our creative way have called it non-project based supportive housing which confuses a whole lot of people all that means is that a provider um, either is approached by a property manager in the area or they approach a property manager in the area. They know that there's an apartment complex that seems to be well maintained and um, for all you've heard, you know, there are the, the residents are more or less happy. It seems like a, a great place so that the provider will approach the the uh, property manager and ask if they would be interested in having um, our the individuals that we support serve as their supportive population. A lot of times um, some of the populations that are designated are have a harder time um, really adjusting to in the independent living. And, you know, what we bring that a lot of other agencies don't is we bring the built-in cradle-to-grave services. You know, so once someone's with DDS, they're, we're married forever. You know, we're always in the mix. And so that makes both the property managers and the um, developers sort of breathe a sigh of relief because at the end of the day, it would fall to them, and that's certainly not their area of expertise, to put it mildly. So um, so we call it non-project-based supportive housing. We have um, six projects um, already up and running, and what we have asked um, develop, we, we have asked providers to look for is at least two apartments that might be available now with a commitment for others as they become available. And so they go through the same process. They come up with a, with a care plan. Um, uh, individuals are vetted through um, Pratt and are prepared and do all the applications. So the process is kind of the same, but it can happen in two months or three months or even less depending on, you know, on the timing. And, um, so that's those are the two ways that we've um, interpreted supportive housing. 
Um, I just want to reiterate that rental assistance is available with um, every supportive housing designation. So we uh, have partnered with the Department of Housing, and um, I don't know if you're familiar with, with this, but the uh, everybody knows Section 8 and how Section 8 works and all of that. Um, and that's, it's a, anyway, it's a bureaucratic puzzle that's very complicated but it works and the Department of Housing knows how to make it work and it's legal and they haven't gotten tr in trouble with Section 8. So what the state of Connecticut did when they felt they were not getting enough um, Section 8 uh, vouchers, they were saying they felt, first of all, that they were getting short, you know, the short end of the stick compared to other states. They didn't agree necessarily with the formula that was being used. Um, and so the governor, I think we're going into our 10th year now. So it was the prior governor who established, under his leadership, established the RAP program. And RAP is easy, also not especially creative, rental assistance program. Um, and uh, RAP voucher, the RAP program runs exactly the same way the state, the that, that um, Section 8 runs. They establish the same rules, the same requirements, everything. They're like, okay, the feds like it. They haven't gotten in trouble. We're going to do exactly what they do, but we're going to do it with our money. And so um, RAP vouchers are, they have the same mechanism, like they have RAP waiting lists um, for individuals who are eligible and are waiting their turn to get a certificate, et cetera, et cetera. So um, we have negotiated with the Department of Housing for um, RAP vouchers to go with each one of the um, individuals that we place in supportive housing. And we were very excited about that because that certainly was a, you know, potentially that was a real stumbling block. You know, mm -hmm. how, how are we gonna help folks do that? And um, it really is, I have to say, I probably should, shouldn't even say anything, but I can't help myself. But I just learned that um, the Department of Housing also has a program to help individuals who are going from um, going into independent living, either from homelessness into their own apartment or whatever, um, down payment assistance, which has been a little bit of a hassle. And so we now will have all of our individuals apply for down payment assistance. We're going to let that, we're going to make that known to all of the case managers because we have some individuals, as you know, who go into IHS settings um, mm -hmm. or who have, find their own apartment. And th that's a hit, the down, the down payment and the security deposit. And so I'm going to, we're going to get that information and get it out there. If there's money to be had, we want to have it for our folks. And so um, that's the latest, latest um, development on our front. And um, do you have any questions for me? Uh, yes, Alba, uh, thank yes. you very much. It's so informative. Um, the uh, the uh, project through Favor, Lavender Fields, and yes. they are examples of this model, are they? Yes. Yes, I assume so. I just wanted to be Perfectly <laughs> correct. Yeah, yes. thank, thank you. And they have, um, I don't know if you're, if you or anyone that you know who might be seeking supportive housing is in their whatever catchment area or whatever, because we have um, one project that's going to open this fall. And um, we have one, we actually have six projects in to the LIHTC, um the funding for funding sources, competitive funding sources, you know, developers compete for a particular um, uh, additional assistance from the state. And there are a whole bunch of categories that they need to have points in. And one of the areas is um, uh, is to have identified a supportive um, a population in need of supportive housing that they will partner with and that that um, entity, which is in our case is DDS, will commit in writing to um, to support X, Y, Z number of units um, if they make them available for our population. And so we have six that we've already done are already in that partnership with. And we're everybody's praying to whoever their higher power is that a few of them, you know, come through. And, and uh, one of them is a second favor um on the border, I want to say it's on the border of, of um, Farmington and West Hartford, but it's on the Farmington side, which gives them more points than West Hartford. So, um, so Alba, that's the one opening up in, in the fall, did you say? That's the one on 80 South Street. If you could drive by it now, it's right on 80 South Street and it's going up quickly. 
And um, so that's the one that's going to be opening up, we think, in the fall. That's the projected wow. date. Wow. Thank you. Wow. Sure. We're very, very excited about that. Um, please, you know, communicate, ask questions and communicate with your um, case managers, even if it's something that you're contemplating, even if even if you're I, I have a very dear friend who lives in Massachusetts. And every time she sees me now that I do this work, she's like, I know, I know I should be thinking about it. I know her daughter's 25 years old. I know I should be thinking about it. I know I should be preparing. and um, but isn't and hasn't. So she's, you know, so I talk to her all the time about little ways, little steps that she could take um, to, to begin to prepare her um, daughter. I completely feel her her uh, angst, you know, when she thinks about that. And um, that's, that's not to be uh, spoken of lightly or taken for granted. That's a big step for any parent, let alone a parent of someone who's got special needs. So um, I am... If you have any questions for me, please, if you uh, think of any questions after the meeting is over, um, certainly, um, well, my email is, is in the system and you absolutely can, you know, communicate with me directly. Um, Heather, you said it's like Heather without an H, right? Okay. Heather can let you know how to get in touch with me. Um, you know, uh, Stacy can. I um, I'm like a uh, cheering section for this. So I really want to answer questions and make sure that all of the misunderstandings are clarified. Yes. Uh, Adriana. Uh, Adriana. Hi. Yes. Thank yeah. you. Oh, but that was a great presentation. Everyone's done a great job. I just had a quick question. Um, I know, um, you know, I love sharing links and things like that's what we do at Connecticut Family Support Network mm -hmm. is share resources. So I want to know, is the map on the supported housing uh, DDS page, is that updated? Because it doesn't uh, really, the map itself, usually most documents have like a date of revision or anything, but this one doesn't. So I can't tell if that's the most current. I can tell you that even if it is the most current which would explain why it would be up there it's not current like we literally okay. had um you know a development just open in january and mm -hmm. you know we have other um developments have come you know are in the queue and by the end of this month or the beginning of next month if we're lucky there'll be at least four projects that don't even appear on the map yet that are coming and so kyle fishbein who's uh, the deputy um county mm -hmm. manager's uh, assistant he keeps the map um, up to date. And um, if you're interested in seeing it, I'm, okay, this is a program that that forces me to walk and chew gum at the same time, and that's not a strength of mine. Okay, so here's the chat. I'm going to put my email in the chat. You shoot me a quick mm -hmm. email. I will send you uh, the latest map. Thank you so much. Sure. Thank you, Elba. This was absolutely fabulous. You're very welcome. It, My pleasure. Yeah, it clarified so many things. Thank you. Um, any other questions for Elba? No. All right. I don't know what we have for legislative um, updates tonight. I know normally Rick's here and he's right there waiting for us, um, <laughs> but he's I don't see him tonight. So. I'm wondering, we may not have any right now. All right, we can always, I guess, go back. We have an um, open forum for public participation. Oh, so quiet this evening. All right, well, I I think we've reached the end of our, our evening. Oh, um, well. Yes, Ellen. Um, People First are, is having a conference, but I don't really know when. But okay. I'm going to have to talk to Parne, um about that. So I just. Okay, so there's first. one. There's one coming up. Yes. Okay, cool. We can probably send to, that out. I just have we'll to make sure. Okay, we'll make sure that we send that information out to everyone. 
I just have to talk to partners about that. Okay. Not the president of people first. I just want to tell you. Okay, that's no, that's awesome. Thank you, Elle. All right, Shannon. Hi everyone, my name is Shannon Clank. I am new to this group. It's my first time here. I really wanna thank Heather for sharing the information so I could get online this month. Um, I've been trying to get online unsuccessfully for a couple months, which is totally my user error. Um, and so I don't know if there's anyone who's could put their willing to put their name and number in the chat that I could reach out to just to learn a little bit more. Obviously I'm, I'm gleaning what this community of individuals do and how we learn and support each other and learning what's going on and available in the North region and so on and so forth, but just throwing it out there kind of new. Um, any other supports information, Hi. anyone Hi. willing to talk offline would be great. All right. Shannon, I'd be more yeah, than happy yeah, to share bit. that information. Yeah, I'm Shannon. I'm Kim's daughter. I'm it's Kim and Ellen. I'm her daughter. I'm sorry. I'm not. I'm, my camera's not on because, you know. Um, um, yeah, I have a. I I'm a person with a disability, so. Yeah. All right. Okay. All right. Any other questions or concerns? No, I think, again, we have reached the end of our meeting. Um, thank you all for attending, and I look forward to seeing you next month. Good thank night. Thank you. Good night. Thank, thank you. Thank you very much. A lot of information. Thank you. Yes. Um, do you want to stay on for a second? We can...